Hey, hackers and tech enthusiasts, welcome to Protocol, the series where we unravel the history and mysteries behind the technology shaping our digital world. I'm your host, Dade, and today we're going to answer a couple of questions fundamental to this series. What is a protocol and who makes them? Protocols underpin basically everything around us. Our phones use protocols that are built on other protocols that are built on other protocols still in order to communicate with one another. The components within our phones even use protocols to communicate with each other as part of a complex system. It's basically turtles all the way down. So what exactly is a protocol and why should you care? A protocol, at its most fundamental, is simply a set of rules that two or more systems agree upon that describe how data may be exchanged or processed. Protocols can come in all shapes and sizes, including communication protocols that dictate how two systems talk to each other, authentication protocols that describe a set of processes and formats for authenticating a user or system, and cryptographic protocols that describe how data should be encrypted and decrypted. There are also examples of protocols all around us that we've likely become blind to, such as queuing up in a line to get into your favorite store, passing dishes around a table at dinner, or obeying traffic signals to ensure cars and people alike can get safely to their destinations. Building on the traffic example, some elements of our protocol might include behaviors to adhere to when we see a red light, an amber light, or a green light, as well as behaviors we adhere to when we see a red octagon that says the word stop written on it. By adhering to this protocol, we ensure that we're less likely to have an accident with other vehicles. Other elements of this traffic protocol might include general color associations. Orange typically means a temporary caution, such as a roadwork sign or an orange cone in the road. Red typically means stop, whether it's a solid red light, blinking red light, or a red stop sign. Yellow might mean a more permanent caution, such as children crossing a road near a school or a sharp bend in the road up ahead. These are all elements of the protocol that are designed to get people safely to their destination. In the digital world, protocols play a fundamental role in communicating. If not for the advent of communication protocols like Ethernet, Internet Protocol, or Transmission Control Protocol, our smartphones would be a whole lot dumber and it would be much harder to follow our favorite computer hackers on social media. With any luck, at least they could probably still play Snake. Shout out to my Nokia brick phone users. It took decades for these communication protocols to build on each other enough to gain mainstream adoption, and some protocols are certainly more popular than others. Understanding these protocols and feeling comfortable exploring new protocols can make us better developers, better sysadmins, and better hackers. Whether a protocol becomes part of our everyday lives or not depends on a few major factors. Does the protocol solve a problem better than existing solutions? Maybe in a way that makes it easier to use or in a way that makes it faster. Do developers and manufacturers adopt this protocol so that our devices can actually talk to each other? If a protocol isn't accepted by two devices trying to talk to each other, they're probably not going to succeed. So how does a protocol come to be? Who gets to just decide what all of our devices should be capable of? This is where standards organizations come into play. There are several standards organizations that all play some role in the protocols that we use today. These organizations tend to focus on different areas of specialty, which allows them to produce protocols and standards for broader use cases, while allowing other standards and protocols to be built on top of them. We'll spend a lot of time in this series covering internet protocols, and so it's important to know about the Internet Engineering Task Force, or IETF. Founded all the way back in 1986, the IETF is a volunteer-led nonprofit organization responsible for the technical standards that make up the modern internet protocol suite. But we don't want to be limited to just exploring internet protocols. What about things that connect us to the internet, things like Wi-Fi? This is where the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, or IEEE, comes into play. IEEE is a huge organization that covers a wide variety of specialties, but will mostly be covering their network in the computer networking space, such as Ethernet and Wi-Fi. I've also talked about the protocols our phones use. If you're thankful that you can watch this video on your phone right now, you have another standards organization you can thank for that. The protocols our phones use for this today are largely thanks to an organization called Third Generation Partnership Project, or 3GPP. 3GPP is responsible for GSM, LTE, and 5G cellular standards. They're made up of several standards institutions from around the world that work in cooperation to bring us interoperable devices. And before our phones were in our pockets, they were sitting on our desks or hanging on our walls pre-cellular phone service, along with a slew of modern technical standards and some not-so-modern but still-in-use standards, is largely thanks to an organization called the International Telecommunications Union, or the ITU. The ITU today is part of the United Nations, but it actually predates the United Nations by 80 years. The ITU is broken up into three branches, radio communication, ITU-R, standardization, or ITU-T, and development, or ITU-D. Not all protocols have been built with open communication in mind. 
Sometimes protocols are created by companies who wish to keep them secret or otherwise restrict their usage so that they can have a competitive advantage. In many cases, these proprietary attempts at protocols have been beaten out by those who built on open standards and encouraged adoption. Remember, protocols are really only useful if multiple devices know how to speak them. In other cases, proprietary protocols have had significant advantages over their open standard counterparts. One reason for this is the ability for the protocol owner to be able to rapidly iterate on the protocol and ensure all devices are using the latest version. Hopefully now you have an understanding of what protocols are and some of the organizations responsible for creating and maintaining them. In future episodes, we'll explore each of these organizations in a bit more detail to figure out just how they operate and how you can get involved in creating and maintaining protocols and standards. Do you have a protocol you'd like to see a video on? A protocol you want to know more about? Or maybe a long forgotten protocol that hasn't seen use since the term computer bug meant a moth that got stuck in a relay? Let us know in the comments down below. If you're interested in seeing more of this series on protocols, give this video a thumbs up and make sure you're subscribed so you can get notified when the next episode goes live. With that, I've been Dade. Stay curious, stay connected.